What's up, Instagram crew? I got my guy coming on today. For those that saw my story, Dr. Z, owner of Ignite Physio. Uh, this one is going to be a fun one. We're talking all things ACL rehab recovery. Uh, Dr. Z is a stud when it comes to this stuff, and this is his specialty, his bread and butter. So I'm excited to have him on to talk all things ACL, knee recovery, any knee injuries. He's the guy to talk to. So as soon as he jumps on here, we're going to get him uh, rolling, sharing some of his expertise. And if you guys have any questions as we go with it, feel free to just throw those throw those on. But as soon as we join, we'll get him linked up. Ignite Physio in the house. Linking him up here now. Z. What's up, Dave? How's it going, man? Good, dude. How you doing? I'm good, good. I'm happy to be here, man. It's great. I know. Excited to have you. I appreciate you, you jumping on. So we got a lot of fun stuff, fun stuff here planned. So how you doing? Things are good, man. Just middle of a treatment day. Got a, had a morning full of people and got a couple more people after this today. So it's a busy week, as you know well enough. You know, you know how, how much of a grind this is sometimes. For sure. So let's uh, let's dive right into it. So uh, I want want to just start with you giving maybe a, a quick background. I know it could be a longer background, but a, a quick background on what you're up to professionally, the type of population you're working with. Yeah, so I um, I started my own practice last year. Um, it's a kind of a concierge, it's like a hybrid practice. I do um, primarily cash based PT um, and performance training. In addition, I do accept Medicare. I just I, I love the Medicare population, so I, I like helping those people out as well. So. That's the one insurance that I do take. Um, I'm, I'm in North Orange County. Um, biggest thing for me is populations I work with are, it's kind of across the spectrum. I mean, a big chunk of it is athletes and um, you know, youth, high school, collegiate athletes, and then um, the active population. So I work with a lot of CrossFitters. I work with a lot of runners, um, just a lot of people who want to be active, you know, a lot of Spartan race people, things like that. Um, I think the big thing is anybody who has a desire to stay active and stay moving. I mean, that's, that's kind of my bread and butter and who I love working with. Yeah, I think that's a, an awesome population. You get a, I mean, make a lot of change with those. And I, I know we talked uh, kind of beforehand with where to where to go with this talk. And uh, you see quite a bit of ACL rehab. Yeah. Is that pre-surgery, post-surgery? You want to tell me a little bit about that? Primarily post-surgery. Um, I typically tend to see. I've seen a few from the from kind of the start to finish, um, or currently have one that's that, that I've been seeing from the from kind of the beginning, but. For the most part, it's somewhere around that couple month mark after they've kind of exhausted their traditional rehab and um, are looking to kind of do a little bit more sports, but not sports specific at that point, but to get down the line to being a little bit more sports specific and return to sport. Because I really do feel like that's a very, very underserved population. And so that's who I tend to seek out and try to work with. I'm just super passionate about ACL rehab. And so that's it's what I love to do. So that's pretty much the, the big part of the a big chunk of who I see uh, ACL wise. So they'll see they'll see another physical therapist typically right after for how long before they before they see you? It varies for the most part, um, but I would say somewhere around uh, anywhere from six weeks to three months, and then beyond that, it's when it's pretty much when they get close to getting back to jogging and returned and cleared for that stuff. That's usually when I start to see people, um, and then we kind of take it from there. But the goal ultimately is to be able to see people from the start to finish, and hopefully you you know optimize and maximize outcomes from there. Sure. And uh, for for those that aren't as familiar with the rehab process, so why the you want to talk a little on why the transition from why they would be switching therapists and why they're coming to see you at that at that point? Sure, yeah, you know, a big part of it is um, you know financially driven. Um, so a big a big chunk of it is because that's what their insurance covers. And at the at the early stages, it's not at, in my mind, it's not a skill. It's not something that really requires a lot of expertise and specificity because you're really just trying to regain range of motion trying to fire up the quads, get the hammies firing again, just really get a lot of like uh, muscle activation type stuff and, and range motion based things. Um, and so it's not as, um, I don't think it's as, as important to see somebody like me from the very get go, although it can be helpful. I mean, the big thing for me is when they get to that three ish month mark, that's when their insurance benefits start to slow down a little bit. They tend to have used a lot of their benefits in the early stages. And I feel like it kind of should be flipped if the person is pretty motivated and, and, and kind of self-sufficient in terms of being able to do their home exercise program and stuff like that. And so I don't end up seeing them until then, because I really do feel like that's where the expertise comes into play. Cause I really don't think every physical therapist is cut out to rehab somebody from start to finish with uh, after an ACL reconstruction, the same way I wouldn't be the ideal person to see somebody with a, you know, that had a super, super high, high level stroke 
or a spinal cord injury. That's not my expertise. I can probably do some things, but I'm not the person to see for that. And there's a lot of other PTs that are better than me at that. And so I think ACL rehab kind of falls into that category as well. I think it's cool what you said there too, being able to acknowledge where those limitations are and so much we want to be the, you know, we want to, whether professionally or personal lives too, of be this catch all thing of trying to, trying to do it all, but knowing where that, uh, where your talents lie, where those uh, passions are too, and being able to, to fully help people, help people that way. Well, school teaches us that because they, they teach us to be generalists. I mean, their goal is to just help us get licensed and be able to work and not, you know, kill anybody in the process. So, um, so that, that's what we learn in school. And so a lot of these specific, the specific things that we do in our specialties, it all comes after school. And, it, and I think that we're all going to find a path to go down that we're passionate about because otherwise really, why are you doing what you're doing? You know? Yeah. So with the ACL stuff, what, what got you, uh, what got you down that, what, that path former injury or did, did you, was there something specifically that sparked that? To be honest, no, I just, I really, you know, I've always been a sports guy. And so sports has always been my thing. And, and every year that's gone by, it's gotten more prevalent and it's becoming kind of this epidemic at this point. And so I, I just love helping athletes. And it's, it's probably one of the most common injuries that athletes are, are undergoing now at this point, especially the serious ones. And so I, you know, not, you know, knock on wood, I've never had, I've never had a surgical procedure done. I've never had a, a serious injury. Um, I, I never even had therapy formally myself. I mean, that's not really how I even got into this in the first place. But, um, you know, for me, it's just, it's a population that I have a ton of respect for. And it's, it's a population that I really truly love helping get back to doing what they love to do. That's awesome. Funny. Yeah, I'm the same way with that. So a lot of people assume that I went through like formal rehab or surgery growing up playing sports, but uh, just love being around athletics and training and yep. human body. And that's, that's how I kind of got into that too. So what, uh, what do you think is the, the biggest problem in, we can, we can take this two ways. So uh, the biggest problem in training that may be leading up to ACL injury and also the biggest problem from surgery through the rehab process. I think taking us up to the injury, I think the biggest issue is um, their capacity to withstand the forces that sport you know, implies on them. So to, to, you know, low tolerance and demand um, from their sport, because I really don't think there's enough emphasis being placed on the the, the um, kind of precursors to injury. And I think that's a big part of the problem. And so when we talk about, you know, movement patterns, body mechanics, we talk about hip strength, we talk about all the things that we know lead to or can make you more susceptible to an ACL tear. I think that's the biggest thing is those things aren't being addressed at young ages. And then these athletes are, I, I consider athletes to be the, the greatest compensators known to man. They will always figure out a way to do something and do a task regardless of whether they're doing it right or not. And so I, I really do think that they rely on their talent. They rely on their skill for so long, but after a while, because the, the, their volume is higher, they're playing more, they're playing year round. Now they're specializing earlier. There's a lot of different things that sort of factor into that. And I think that's the biggest issue going into why it happens in sport and why it's becoming more prevalent. And we honestly don't have great answers that's conclusive across the board from a research standpoint. You know, we, we kind of have an idea of what things work well, but we really don't know what specific things that we need to be doing on a consistent basis across the board. Although we're kind of getting there, we're getting better, but it's still not quite there. And then um, in rehab, the biggest thing is that bridge. It's, it's that what kind of what we discussed a little bit earlier. It's, it's going from that second and third month to getting back onto the field or onto the court or whatever your sport is. Um, that, that, that's an underserved population. They're really not getting any guidance. They're getting discharged from traditional therapy when they're, because their insurance tells them that they're ready to live their life. But that's not their ultimate goal, and that wasn't their prior level of function. And they don't have any guidance on how to get back to playing the sport or the, the activity that they love to do because it, the insurance doesn't value that. And, and that's a whole other topic and discussion. But that, that's really where I think people are missing the boat is that, is that month three to month six and seven mark and trying to get back to the field of the court. And, uh, and hearing you talk, that you'd say that applies to not just athletes. I know you say athletes, but mm -hmm. even for the, you know, the average gym goer, the CrossFitter, the runner – uh, I mean, you'd put them in the same category with the importance of that, that mid range three to six month as well. Oh, absolutely. It's the, it's the, you know, the, the grandparents that want to play with their grandkids and be able to go out there and play sports with them and, and mess around at the park or somebody that just wants to run five K's or 10 K's or do Spartan races like that, that they're all athletes in their own right. It's just a matter of how we define athlete at this point. And we have the traditional team sport athletes, but at the end of the day, everybody is an athlete in their own right. It just depends on what kind of demands that you're looking to withstand in your game day. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I know people hear athlete though. When I, I, I sometimes, I guess mistakenly interchange that with patient client, 
athlete yeah. and people hear that and they assume they're like, Oh, I'm just, I'm just trying to get back to, to going to the gym and I'm, I'm not exactly an athlete. And it's, you know, it's just as important for those people to, to be able to take advantage of that and get back to those things, even though it may not be, you know, playing on Sundays in the NFL, it's, you, you know, still of equal importance for their, for their life, their family, friends, their hobbies, passions and all that. Exactly. I to- totally agree with that. Where does the, uh, where does the psychological, thing come into play with uh so with this return to sport and how much how much of that are you working out with them from a from an exercise standpoint i know that's in a lot of times it's a fine line for us as as pts to where we you know where we fall in that and i want to kind of hear your thoughts on that well you know i the, the thing i try to do from the get-go is set expectations i think that's number one um because that you know every patient has a uncle, cousin, friend, neighbor that has their opinions on what, where they feel like they should be at at month three or month seven or month nine. And at the end of the day, like you mentioned earlier, this is a very individualized rehab process. And so not everybody's going to go along the same line. Some people are back on the field in seven months and people are back in 15 months. And not, none of them are right or wrong. It just depends on whether they've been able to pass the prerequisite milestones in order to get there. The big thing for me is I set expectations from the get-go and let them know that we're going to base things off of a standardized, structured approach, and it's not going to be based off of time. And they know that from day one that they work with me. I will never clear somebody just because they're nine months post-op. It's always going to be based on what their functional capabilities are and what the return to sport testing says. And the second thing is, you know, just shutting up and listening to them. Like they have a lot of stuff. They, they got to vent. This is a, this is an important process for them. They're, the life as they know it is kind of like changed for that, that period of time. And so they need somebody to listen to them and to hear, hear them out when they're having bad days and let them know that they're not alone and finding support system for them and just having conversations between sets. And, you know, as we're resting, like that's the biggest thing for me is just is making sure that they're aware of what's going on. They're hundred percent there along every step of the process. And we're just helping build their confidence as they get further and further down the line, because I think that's the biggest thing. I mean, that's the, one of the biggest setbacks from a non-physical standpoint is they just don't feel ready to get back on the field and everybody's telling them that they should be there. And I think a big part of this is confidence and being able to instill that in them as it gets further and further down the line. I, I love that with the outcomes over the time base, because that's got to be hard when do you think going into surgery, they're they're fed too much from a, a time-based standpoint in terms of expectations versus the, that it's going to be individualized? A hundred percent, because I've seen some of the packets that they bring to me on their first visit, and it's and it's a packet that's like this thick, and it has this is what you should do, this is your post-op, what you should be managing, and then it has a nice little protocol on the end that's one page long that basically goes up to about three months, and then and then it says six months return to sport, nine months, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, how do you even, how can you even set that expectation from the get-go? It doesn't make any sense. And so they're, they're expecting that because that's what their surgeon tells them. And that's what their friends and family tell them. And so I, I just think that they're going to listen to those people and being able to present literature in a way that's easily digestible for them and that they understand, I think is an important part of this as well. And you mentioned the, uh, you mentioned the, you know, there's ups and downs and confidence and venting and all those issues. Uh, I think that's something, at least, you know, personally, that's something that gets masked a little bit in terms of, like, people going into it. It's, they know they're going to have a tough, you know, tough phase when people see, when people see someone walking around on, you know, on crutches or in a, in a brace. It's like, okay, obviously, there, you know, there's that visual representation of, of injury, and it's, yeah. you know, there's expected limitations with that. But this is something that's carried on throughout the, throughout the process, even, you know, like you said, six months in, there's going to be ups and downs. And I think that's part that people don't realize. Is that, is that something you see with the people you work with? Oh, absolutely, man. And it's especially when they, you know, we expect something to go a certain way or we, we hope for something to go a certain way when they go to a doctor's visit or we do return to sport testing and their hop testing isn't where they want it to be or, um, you know, their single leg sit to stand is not where it needs to be. Like being able to, they're already trying to overcome adversity. The last thing we want is for them to have all of these huge hurdles along the way. But, you know, what, what I try to instill in a lot of my clients that are that are coming back from this is the big thing is, is that these obstacles are not like long term setbacks. These are just short term little bumps in the road that is just going to make you stronger down the line and make you more resilient. And my demeanor and the way I respond to the way those things happen when these adversities happen, I think plays a big role, because if I'm like, oh, crap, like, why are we dealing with this? And they, and they see me and they feel that. That's just reinforcing it. And, and I, yeah, I get frustrated because I want people to get better faster. But at the end of the day, I will never let a client see that because I want them to know that it's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. And at the end of the day, if we lose two weeks here and a couple of weeks there, in the grand scheme of things, we're talking about a, a few weeks here and there over a one plus to two plus year process. 
yeah, that's uh, and that's awesome what you said there too, with because that's that's in that's in surgery, but that's in you know see that in, uh, I mean, CrossFitters and, and gym goers that you know the weekend warriors that are pushing it so hard to try and get one extra workout in at the expense of losing two three weeks, sometimes two three months of injury yeah. to get one or two extra workouts in and being able to you know manage manage that from a from a mental side of it too, because that's usually where it's where it's at, where it's this, this need that oh, I have to be improving every single day and I have to get this extra thing in when it's like, that's not the reality of, of how our bodies recover, of how our bodies function. Well, my favorite analogy to use, and I use this not with just ACL with everything, is that the rehab process is sort of like the stock market. Mm -hmm. So if you, if, you, if you take a step back and you look at the last like 90 years of the stock market, it's gonna trend this way at the end of the day. You look at this kind of, this, this micro view or macro view, you're going to see this trend upwards. But if I hone in on one year, it's a lot of this. But at the end of the day, a lot of this happens, but we're still moving in this direction. It just doesn't look as, as steep when you're looking at it on a micro level. And so that's, that's my favorite analogy to use. And that seems like that resonates well with people because that's what they're feeling on a week to week basis. And some weeks they feel fantastic. And some weeks they just feel like, like crap. And it's just one of those things that happens. And it's just, we have to respect that, that physiologic part of the process. I'm, st I'm stealing that analogy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Hunter, it's all, it's all yours, man. It's all yours. I probably stole it from somebody else, yeah, too. I just yeah. don't remember. So we got a uh, – hey, Russ, if you're still here. Russ, he's our guy here. He's asking, what about the NFL Russ. players that return from ACL in 10 months? Why can't that be me? Well, I, I think first off, Russ, you're going to have to be a little bit taller in, in, terms of, in order to be in the NFL. That, that's, step, that's step one. Like, I'd have to be a lot faster in order to do it, too. But, the, you know, what you have to remember with a lot of the NFL players and the professional athletes is they have round-the-clock care. This is not one of those things where you go into therapy twice a week or once a week. They have people that are working with them on a day-to-day -day basis on all aspects. And they've got the diet part of it down. They've got the sleep part of it down. Stress levels are a lot lower. I, I know they have different types of stresses, but they don't have to worry about paying the bills and their kids acting out. And they don't have to worry about all that stuff as much as the, the regular Joe Schmo like me have to worry about that stuff, you know? So that's a big part of it as well. And so they, that round the clock care is just such a huge, part, a huge benefit for them for sure. For sure. Yeah. And you, uh, I know you mentioned, and I love you mentioned the, True story. Not many Filipinos in the NFL. <laughs> Not yet, Russ. Give it, give it some time. <laughs> uh, but you mentioned the the stress part, the sleep part, and uh, you know that's something I, I think we we take for granted how how important that is. But would you say not a lot of people are you know aware of how that affects their their recovery, their healing? I'd say like ninety five percent of the people that I see patients like in terms of patients don't understand that part of it, or they don't see the the tie between the two things but if your body's not well rested and you're not firing on all cylinders just because you have just because your your knees going through this physiologic process and your body's sort of just going to take over the stresses that go through your body on a day-to-day -day basis are huge it's like you're not getting good sleep and you're not eating well and the, and the fuel you're putting and another analogy is like would you put crappy would you put fuel that you find on the side of the road in your car and expect it to run 100 percent? it's the same thing that we do with food and we don't look at it that way and so it, that's just one of those things where we have to make sure that we're looking at the entire person. And these are discussions that I have with patients as well. I just, I try not to overload them from the get go, obviously with all this stuff, because we have a task at hand, but this is all stuff that is, especially for the high level athletes, they're non-negotiables. You have to be able to take those, that stuff into consideration. Otherwise I don't think you're going to be a high level athlete for very long. Yeah. So true. And I like, I like how you, you know, you made a quick little plug that that's not all happening on day one. Those, those conversations, I think. For me, yeah any trainers, PTs, anyone working with athletes or, or any, any type of population that we so quickly want to just tell them how much we know about, about this topic yeah, on, yeah. on day one. And, and I fell into that coming out of, coming out of PT school and quickly learned that people don't care and they they get overwhelmed when that, when that all happens on day one and being able to build trust first and establish that throughout the, throughout the process. Yeah. Overwhelming on day one is just not going to do anybody any good. I, I learned that the hard way a lot, trying to show them how smart I was and how much I knew about things as, as a new PT. But as you get older, you start to realize that, A, they don't care half the time. I mean, so you don't need to bombard them and then you build the rapport with them, you develop a relationship and then you start to find out the people that do care. And that's when you have those honest and frank discussions with them that, that they're actually going to resonate with them in the long run. For sure. I got a buddy on here. Uh, Matt says, <clears throat> so Matt, uh, any take on glucosamine running the LA marathon on Sunday and just started taking it. Cause I think I have some form of runner's knee. Uh, you know, from traditionally with the glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate, again, that's not my expertise, but in terms of uh, people have used it historically for, you know, 
arthritis and cartilage degeneration and stuff like that. I, I've seen studies that have said that it's fantastic and it works really well and it helps restore hyaline cartilage and blah, blah, blah. And then I've seen studies that say it's just, it's just melting a hole in your wallet. And so um, I think at the end of the day, if, it, if you feel like it helps and you feel like it benefits you and you're okay purchasing it on a monthly basis, I don't think there's anything wrong with taking it. But I don't think I've seen enough from a literature standpoint that, make, that makes me believe that it's going to do anything from on a, on a joint level in terms of developing be better, uh, you know, better um, hyaline cartilage or, or any hyaluronic acid within the joint. I don't know what you've seen from that standpoint. Yeah, in the same boat. And, uh, with with that question, especially with you know the short time frame on that, glucosamine is not going to you know work in in that time frame to do that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, getting to the true underlying cause of that in in any short amount of time is you know at this point. Uh, it's a little different just trying to get some symptom relief there to to get uh to get you through the race so that's going to look a little different than you know we don't have time to get to the root cause and address why that's happening yeah. that's something we'd want to look at after the marathon but leading up to it uh i'm not you know anyone that knows me i'm not a huge proponent of foam rolling per se but you know things like foam rolling and stretching when we're just looking for some symptom relief could be some you know ways to at least take a little bit of the that job to get you through the race because when we're working on this yeah, exactly. kind of time frame, it's about it's about getting uh, finding a way to get get through it without making things you know too much worse at that point. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with using those for short term benefits. I don't have any problem with it so long as the expectation is said that this is not solving your problem. You still need to to delve deep into figuring out the root cause of the issue. For sure. Yeah. So anything that <clears throat> anything that'll get you relief leading up to the race, but you know, after we want to take a little deeper dive into why that's you know why that's flaring up. And maybe look into some isometrics, some stuff along those lines too, just to figure out if you can kind of calm the tendon down a little bit before you get into the into the race, and then and then after the fact, maybe see somebody and see a healthcare provider and see if they can figure that out for you. Definitely, and isometrics would mean uh, just not going through a, a a range of motion with the joint. So joints not moving, muscles contracting without uh, taking the joint through a lot of bending, straightening in the case of the knee. Exactly. So D Moreno, 9-2, two, uh, two weeks post-op after patellar tendon graft. Is it true that patellar tendon graft is one of the hardest to heal? I'm so frustrated. It's, it's definitely one of the more challenging ones for sure. The biggest thing with the patellar tendon graft is we, we, we take the risk of, you know, anterior knee pain down the line, patellar tendinopathy, things along those lines. But what the studies show with patellar tendon grafts is that their long-term success rates are, are actually a lot better than the hamstring graft and most definitely better than a cadaver graft. And so from a long-term health standpoint, you, I think I personally, if I had, if I tore my ACL tomorrow and I had to make a decision on it, I would get a patellar tendon graft right now because I haven't seen enough uh, justification for the hamstring graft and for the cadaver graft. And there's some, you know, quad tendon is starting to get a little bit more popular and, I, and there's just a lot of promising things there. But in terms of the patellar tendon graft, yeah, it's frustrating early on because there's just a lot of difficulty with, straightening the knee and bending the knee, I think a lot more than you'll see with the other graphs. But I think you're sacrificing the early on frustrations for the long-term health of your knee and the long-term health of the, of the actual graft itself. So I think you made the right choice. It's just one of those things where you're going to have to deal with some stuff at the beginning and gradually it'll get better. I, I promise you it gets better. It just takes a, a little bit more time than it does with the other graphs. Yeah. So have a, some good encouragement from, from Dr. Z there that uh, that's some of that frustration we talked about, that there are going to be ups and downs yeah. and uh, some things are going to be a little slower to, to come around, but uh, stay patient with it. Keep keep working at it. Uh, keep the live questions coming. I think we had another one. I have all these questions written down that we got submitted ahead of time on patellar tendon graft. If I can't find it, I'll just jump into some of the other ones. But uh, So question was on managing patients with persistent anterior knee pain post ACL repair patellar tendon graft. Yeah, the biggest thing for me is that obviously a lot of this depends on what stage of the rehab process we're in. But if we're if I'm assuming that it, we're, we're you know we're back to squatting, we're back to a lot of the functional stuff, and we're kind of getting up on our feet again, the biggest thing that I use number one is I, I use loaded you know unloaded and then loaded isometrics um, because what patellar tendonitis and any any tendon issue it's all load tolerance based. It's all basically you take the loads that you're putting on your body or on the tendon and your capacity is down here. Anytime the load's higher than the capacity, that's how injury and irritation happens. And so the big thing is doing two major things is modifying our load by bringing that down and then improving our capacity little by little and letting our body and our brain know that it's safe to load this. We just need to do it in a way that's not irritating. And so I think the big thing I start off with is I'll do isometric strengthening on the quads in various ranges of motion, depending on what their symptom level is, depending on their irritability. And then I'll also unload that by taking away any of the irritants temporarily some behavior modification temporarily while we work on other things so it doesn't mean that you stop doing stuff 
It just means that you continue to work on things surrounding it that are not gonna irritate that tendon issue and then gradually reload it in a safe manner to make sure that the load, the tendon can actually tolerate the load that you're putting on it. Yeah, no, I love that. Can you give a, a quick example of like unloaded versus loaded just for those that aren't, aren't as familiar with it? Yeah, so w one unloaded one would be like if you were sitting at the edge of the table and you basically had your, your, your feet hanging over the edge with your knee bent to 90 degrees, and you're sitting right in front of a wall, and you just try to kick your toes into the wall, that's an unloaded isometric. You're, all you're doing is contracting the quad by trying to push your foot through that wall to, to actually impart a little bit of load through, and that would be more of an unloaded, a, li a lighter range of motion. You gradually ramp your way up to 100%. A loaded isometric would be going down into like a, a single leg squat and holding a various position in the bent knee and then holding that position there for the 30 seconds or whatever it is that you're being prescribed. But that, that would be the main difference. Body weight and adding, adding uh, weights, dumbbells, kettlebells, barbells, anything along those lines would co constitute more of a loaded. Sure. Yeah, thanks for clearing that. Because I know a lot of people, they yeah. hear load versus unload, and they think it's just weighted versus unweighted. But a lot of times, and especially depending on the stage of recovery, just being standing in a body weight position is technically loaded compared to what their, Absolutely. What their uh, capacity might be. Absolutely. Okay, so we're gonna keep rifling through some other questions. Uh, so someone, IT, IT band pain, uh, is this normal three years after ACL repair? I, I don't know that it's, it's one of those things that is directly tied to an ACL reconstruction. It's definitely something that can be an issue down the line if you're having any patellar mobility issues, if you've got any, uh, for me, IT band syndrome is such a misnomer because we, we know that the IT band itself isn't the issue. It's, it's the things that are being, the loads that are being imparted on other areas around the body, especially around the hip. So I'll, oftentimes if the, if the hip is still weak, um, if your glutes are still weak, if, you're, if you've got a lot of issues going down at the, at the feet in terms of pronation, not stabilizing there, I'd say if that stuff doesn't get cleaned up during the rehab process, it can lead to compensatory things like an IT band, you know, quote unquote IT band syndrome or patellofemoral dysfunction. So the way your kneecap um, the stress is being placed on your kneecap um, when the knee moves in bending and straightening, like that kind of stuff. But I don't think that I, I haven't seen anything that says that with any conclusivity that IT band related issues are a big part of ACL reconstruction. I just think it's a, it's a symptom of a problem that you're not finding yet. Oh yeah, I, I agree with that, and that's that's something that uh, I mean, it, it could just be completely chance that it's on that that same knee, but like yeah. some you know compensatory pattern that's going on with I mean with, with how much the hips and core and quads and hammies and feet and all those things play a role and you know how we're moving to to just get a more thorough assessment of of you know what exactly is going on at, at those areas to find find more of that root cause yeah and i will add if if you or whoever your healthcare provider is not looking up and down the chain the way dave just described that's a problem because we tend to only focus on the issue and everybody just does nothing by hands-on stuff around the knee on, on, for an ACL reconstruction, all you're doing is working on the knee. If that's all you're doing and we're getting weeks and weeks and months down the line, then I take a good hard look in the mirror and figure out whether you need to go see somebody else because that's not how it should be. I mean, they should be, they should be working on other stuff almost as much as they're working on the knee itself. Absolutely. Well said, yeah, and, and working on the knee, and that includes working on the IT band in that specific case too. Yeah. If it's just soft tissue work to the IT band, again, as we touched on earlier, that can be a, you know, can be a strategy in the short term to allow you to get through some more exercises if it's really symptomatic, but uh, that alone is not going to, not going to solve the problem 99% exactly. of the time. <laughs> exactly. Uh, D Moreno again, what is the normal time that people usually get to unlock their brace and be able to bend the knee? That's again, that's a hard question to answer because it's, again, it's individualized. Everybody's different. So I, I it's hard for me to say a specific number, um, the big thing, too, is that a lot of surgeons have their own protocols that need to be followed and respected as well, because that, you know, their, their goal is to protect the graft. And so they have a world and a wealth of knowledge and experience in terms of ACL reconstructions. They do so many of them. They've seen it over the years. And so um, that's going to be based on that. I've seen some people that don't get it unlocked until four to six weeks. I've seen some people that don't even have a brace coming out of surgery. So it just depends on your quad control. It depends on your range of motion. depends on, on you know, what's going on between the ears in terms of how comfortable you are putting weight through that limb. So there's a lot of factors, but it, I think it could be anywhere from one to two weeks all the way up to six to eight weeks. It just depends on the person. Yeah, definitely. And what uh, you were talking there, that brought up my own question of uh, what do you recommend leading up to? So someone knows they're going to get surgery. Uh, do you recommend getting into to see a PT for, for even just a visit on from an education standpoint, from a strengthening standpoint? How do you tend to go about that? Yeah, I love the idea of prehab before an ACL reconstruction. And that's one thing that the literature is, is slowly growing little by little. We've seen a lot of positive outcomes 
with people who have had prehab. And by prehab, I mean having physical therapy intervention for like a short period of time, somewhere around four to six weeks prior to your surgery, if you have enough heads up, to be able to have better long-term outcomes down the line. Because we're seeing that the literature is showing that the people that had the prehab versus that didn't have the prehab, if everything else is relatively similar, we're seeing a lot better outcomes down the line. And so I think that's definitely something I would be a proponent of. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and even if it's even if it's for a visit or two to get a program that you can yeah. go through on your own, I mean, that, that's huge in being able to prep yourself leading up to that. Yeah, absolutely. I know there's another question on there too with, it was just best prehab workout. Any thought on that? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the best prehab workout I can, that, that I can come up with and, you know, with respect to time and everything is going to be a well-rounded program that addresses all facets of our, our movement and, our, and, the, and the way we do things. And so it's going to be strengthening. It's going to be mobility above and below the knee, uh, uh, you know, all the way up to the, to the mid back um, and all the way down to the feet. It's going to be um, hopping based movements. So like plyometrics, reactive agility. Uh, it's going to be a, a world of things that you're going to do. It should just be a very well-rounded program and not just one thing at all. Yeah, I think that's the best way to say it without uh, without knowing anything else on that on that question. That's a yeah. So week one we'll do this, and then yeah. week two we'll do that. I, I don't think we have time for that. Yeah, we'll, we'll be here for a while. <laughs> uh, another question on so someone who's still wearing a still feels comfortable wearing a brace when working out, and again I, I'm assuming this is longer after recovery. Is this normal? Yeah, I mean, it's, if you don't, if you need, if you don't feel confident in the limb, and you're not able to do those things, and the, the difference between you doing them and not doing them is whether you wear the brace or not, I'd always err on the side of wearing the brace and just do the stuff. Ideally, I would love for the person to be able to do as much as possible without the brace on. Um, but again, it's an individualized thing. Some people are going to wear braces when they come back. Some people are going to need braces while they're doing a lot of the functional stuff early on. The goal is to gradually figure out the reasons why you're not feeling comfortable enough to do it without the brace and make sure you're addressing those things with your healthcare provider to make sure that you're working towards that point that you can actually do things without the brace. Because, you know, at the end of the day, it's not the end of the world if you wear the brace coming back to your sport, but you want to be able to train without the brace on to make sure that you're, that you're doing things and you're unrestricted by anything externally. Absolutely. Uh, so we got, how often do you see true ACL copers? I struggle with positive non-operative result in most runners? I'd say it's, it's split. I've, I've had a couple, I haven't had a ton of people that have, that have gone the conservative route. I've had a few and I probably say, I would say out of the three or four that I've had over my career, and it's really not a lot. Um, I probably had one of them be able to successfully not you know, avoid surgery and the rest of them all ended up having to have surgery regardless of whether they were runners or not. The big thing is, are they buckling? Is there giving out? Is there a constant joint diffusion where you have swelling around the joint every time you do activity? Um, those are a big part of it. And can they restore quad strength, hamstring strength, all that stuff as well? Um, I'd say I haven't seen a ton of success with the non-operative stuff, but, it, but there, there is a reason why there's a term called copers because there's a lot of people that are getting back to doing a lot of high-level stuff. So I think it just depends on the integrity of the actual joint itself and whether the, 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 body, the, the body, you're able to get yourself strong enough to be able to, to withstand the fact that you don't have a quote-unquote have an ACL anymore. Is that more challenging in runners versus other population? I'd say it's more challenging with anybody who's going to do change of direction or, or cutting type sports versus running. Because running tends to be a little bit more straight line. I say with running, the, the issues become more the instability around the joint causes other issues up and down the chain. You're, you're talking about like patellar tendonitis, you know, a lot of bursitis in the hip. Uh, you get a lot of issues like that as opposed to the change of direction people. It's just if, you, if your knee gives out and the buckle because the ACL is not there to do its job, there's only so much you can do if, if, if that's going to continue to happen. And that's usually when people end up having surgery. Sure. Uh, someone who said, I get a popping, clicking sound in the knee. Also added on every Saturday and Sunday, drinks and cigs. I don't know <laughs> what they mean by that. If that's relevant data or not, I'll let you, let you handle that one. If, if, if it's only <laughs> happening while you're drinking and smoking, then I would, I would, I would take a look at what you're, what you're ingesting at those points and see if that's contributing to it at all. Um, popping and popping and cracking though is, is not an issue to worry about as long as it doesn't hurt. If it's not sharp pain associated with it, it's, it's just, it's just joint noise. It's just stuff that you have the buildup of pressure within the joint. It's like gas kind of releasing. And that's really what you happens. Like when you, when you crack a knuckle, pop a joint, things like that, that's all that's happening. So as long as there's not a sharp pain associated with it, it's not affecting your function or your movement, then I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, I agree. If uh, if it's only happening when you're on Saturday, Sunday nights, then you might have to rethink what you're uh, what you're doing with that. And uh, DM me because I want to know what you're having because it sounds pretty interesting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> you address uh, autonomic nervous system, sympathetic, parasympathetic shift in treatment. I wouldn't say I do anything formally in terms of like a system or anything like that, but the, the, we, we treat the nervous system with all of this in terms of, we talked a little bit about reactive agility. So being able to get somebody to respond to external stimuli uh, and respond to those things instead of everything being pre-planned and, and being more internally based. And that's usually where I start and then we end up doing the reactive stuff. Um, but in terms of like a specific set way of going about it, not necessarily, we just know that we're, we're going to be addressing the nervous system based on proprioception, based on their ability to sense their joint in the space when they're doing that dynamic movements. And, and with dynamic warm-ups and things along those lines. And so we, we address it. I know for my, I can speak for myself, I don't address anything specific in terms of a system or anything like that. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think a lot of the, the good practitioners are, are doing that, whether they realize it or not, just exactly warm up and ramping up and cooling down and not, uh, you know, it's like, you don't run a, run a bunch of sprints before going to bed. And <laughs> yeah. when, when you wake up, you don't want to, go lay in a foam roll and read a, a boring book isn't going to get you ready to exactly or anything. So I think we naturally, we, we do a lot of that. It's just, uh, like you said, not the, not the system in place for it. Exactly. Still rolling here, Z. Yes, sir. Uh, return. Uh, let me see here. Return to return to running and notice on the operated side, not achieving full flexion. Yeah, you know, it's hard to say without having any more details just besides just that. But I think the biggest thing I would look at is hamstring strength would be number one. Um, your range of motion. I mean, is your range actually really there? And are you comfortable going through repetitive flexion and extension, bending and straightening over and over and over again? Uh, because that, you know, certain people just have a hard time getting back to that repetitive movement. If they have full range, but they can't do it repetitively, that's a problem. Um, I look at calf strength and see if you're shortening your stride or if you're, if you're, if you're not spending enough time on that limb when you're at the limbs actually on the ground. And there's a lot of factors that go into it, but I'd look at range of motion, hamstring and calf. And then I look at your mechanics and just see if there's anything that you just instinctively just not, or, or subconsciously just doing because you're habitually used to doing that at this point. Yeah, I think, uh, so, so you're saying a good, you know, a good summary of that would be, you know, make sure the joints and muscles are working as they need to, like individually in controlled positions. And yeah. then, you know, take the movement as a, a whole into consideration after that. Exactly. Break down the component parts and then put them all together and take a look at the entire movement for sure. Yeah. I think, cause if you're not, if you're not achieving that in a controlled position, moving one joint, then things are only going to get more exaggerated into, you know, into an activity like running. Exactly. I totally agree. Okay, I think just a couple more here. Top, uh, so top priority for day one of rehab, I run an ACL bridge program, see kids weeks 12 through 16. Yeah, so if it's, um, if we're talking like day one, day one, like the first time you see them, uh, my three big things in the first stage of rehab is quad strength and quad contraction activation, getting rid of joint swelling and range of motion. If you're not hitting those three things early on, then you're, you're pushing yourself back for the rest, of the, the rest of the rehab process. Those are my three big milestones that I hit, and those are all what the, a lot of the research has shown that is pretty consistent to – that positively linked to positive outcomes down the line if you can hammer home on those things relatively early on. So I normally try to get full range in my, in, in my patients by six weeks. That's the goal. That's what we shoot for again. There's, there's variability. It's not always perfect, but that's always my goal. And then getting rid of the swelling and make sure you sure it's not swelling over and over again. And then getting the quads to activate again. That's the biggest part of this. The inhibition on the quads is definitely the biggest problem, especially with the patellar tendon wrap. You see people uh, erring on the side of too aggressive with rehab or too passive? I'd say as a whole, it's more too passive than it is aggressive. I don't think we're doing enough. Like, for example, I don't think we're doing enough open chain stuff. So open chain would be like with your foot hanging in the air where your foot's not planted on the ground. You know, I think we're waiting way too long to do that kind of stuff because we're worried about stressing the ACL. And, and I think people are waiting until like three, four months to start that stuff. And that stuff needs to start well before that. And I usually start getting to that in probably my second month with people, especially like resistance stuff, like even with just a band or something along those lines. Like we need to be doing that stuff a lot earlier on. Yeah, that's a, and, and I'd, I'd say so too. I, I think you, you know, from a healthcare provider standpoint, possibly too, too passive, but I, I'm sure we, you've worked with some athletes too, that you have to almost slow down more than you have yeah. to, to ramp them up. Absolutely. It's a matter of being able to, to know your person and develop that rapport so that they trust you. I think if they trust you, then they're going to listen to what you say and they're going to, they're going to go with it wholeheartedly, but you have to develop that rapport first. And I, like you said, some people just want to go, go, go. And some people are a lot, really hesitant to really get after it. And so just letting them know that they're not going to do any damage. As long as we're doing this under the guidance of somebody who knows what they're doing, you're going to be fine. It's just a matter of just, just trusting in the process. For sure. 
So I want to wrap up with a couple more questions for anyone still hanging around with us live. Feel free to throw your, your last questions in. But uh, for you, Z, who's had a major influence on you personally, professionally, uh, that you've learned a lot from? Uh, you know, personally, I mean, my, my, my biggest hero is my dad. I mean, in terms of he was a he's an entrepreneur. He grew up, he's been an entrepreneur ever since I can remember. And um, learning how to run a business, a lot of that comes from him. And um, having the motivation to do that is, is he's, he's my hero. He's always been my hero. And that's somebody that I've always looked up to. And so personally, that's definitely number one. Um, professionally, I mean, in, in terms of my professional growth, I have a cousin who runs a clinic out in Long Beach here in California. Her name is Mundry Dadul. She a, she did, was a PT about seven years before I did. And seeing what she did and seeing the way she approaches private practice, and she runs like a an outpatient neuro ortho mix rehab facility, but primarily neuro. And seeing the care and the love that she gives to her patients, and I got to do a lot of work there while I was a student and, and just be there. That's where, where I had my first job. I mean, I learned a ton just being around her. So she's probably one of my biggest professional uh, professional role models from that standpoint. And then from the ACL standpoint, it's all the people that I've met through Instagram and, and Twitter and all these people that are doing great things out there with, from the research standpoint. I mean, they're, they're so generous with posting the results of their research and the findings and things like that. It's just really nice to be able to converse with people who are a hell of a lot smarter than I am and be able to learn from them and, and, and go about this. It's great. Yeah, that's uh, I mean, there's so many, so much access to information out there with, you know, people that are, you know, have been doing this for, I mean, years and decades of yeah. experience that, you know, we can, we can learn from, from a professional standpoint, but also for those patients looking to, you know, find, you know, find a proper provider in their area, being able to look and see what kind of info people are putting out and being able to connect with those people is, you know, it's, it's special what, what we have with social media in that sense. And if you're leveraging social media for the right, with, with, for the right reasons, for positive things, there's, there's just so much to learn and you're never going to get to a point where you learn everything there is. So as long as we're all still learning and meaning, I, I mean, I met you at a, at a continuing education course. I mean, so I, I think at the end of the day, like if you're doing things to better yourself, I think you're going to end up surrounding yourself with really, really good people that are that are great to look up to and kind of help push us through. Spot on. And then, uh, so what's one thing your social media following likely doesn't know about you? We're so uh, we're so connected on social media, but yeah. we uh, we're rarely connecting on a, a deeper level. Uh, so I I actually went to school as a business major when I went to undergrad. And so I hadn't, I, I hadn't even thought of doing physical therapy or anything related to sports at that point. I, I was going to be a business major. And I took um, three baseline, like, low-level econ classes. And I was like, holy crap, I suck at this. Like, this is really <laughs> difficult. And I, I was just terrible at it. And so that, that's actually what made me rethink my decision and how I ended up getting into PT. I didn't have the experience of going through PT or anything like that uh, before I became a therapist. And so that's how I found out about PT is because I ended up realizing how much I sucked at business. And, and funny enough, I'm running a business now, which is the most ironic part of this whole thing. But I, whether, whether I'm doing it well or not, it remains to be seen. But I, I'm doing it. But in spite of the fact that I'm not very good at this stuff. But, yeah, I was actually a business major before I ended up becoming a PT. And I'm, I'm thrilled with the way the decision went. That's awesome. Funny how those things work out, though, huh? I know. It's, it's crazy, man. It's, it's nuts. Yeah. So we had one more question come in. Uh, so best way to get rid of scar tissue left behind oh, – disappeared for me there uh, – from the surgery incisions. Uh, from the incisions, early on, I do a lot of scar mobs. I think that's when you can actually have an effect on the tissue is really early on uh, to the person's tolerance, for sure. So I advise patients a lot of times, like early on, when the scar starts to heal and when, you're, when there's no openings anymore, you have to really make sure that part of it, no, no breakage in the skin, no openings, nothing like that. But I'll have them take like a, like a scar away cream or like a Mederma, um, like an aloe vera, something along those lines. And I'll have them just do scar mobs like a couple times a day, every single day to help break that down to make sure it doesn't it doesn't build up and get worse and worse, especially on the patellar tendons. Cool. So I want to respect your time here, Z. Let's finish up. Where can, where can people find you? If you're not following him already on social media, the dude puts out awesome content. I learned, I learned so much from you. So I'm, I'm guessing a lot of other people are in the same boat, but best place to find you on Instagram. Uh, yeah. So Instagram's at Ignite Physio. That's the easiest. That's probably the quickest way to get a hold of me. Um, just shoot me a DM if you have any questions or, like Dave said, check out, stick out in the content. Website is um, www.ignitephysio.com. Um, that's where you'll find a lot of more information about the practice and about um, kind of my story and, and you know, patient testimonials, things along those lines. And um, just keep following good people like Dave. And other, there's a lot of people out there that are putting out fantastic content. And so I'm just very thankful to kind of be a, a small, small fish in a big pond, just trying to do everything I can to kind of educate the public to my best of my capabilities. 
Love it, Z. Hey, really appreciate you getting on. I'm going to, so this will be up on my story for, I think, the next 24 hours, and then I'll upload it on YouTube as well for anyone that wasn't able to catch it live. Share it with anyone who needs to see it, anyone struggling with it. And I know we're both very responsive with uh, getting back to people in our messages. So feel free with any specific questions that come up to reach out to either one of us with that. Absolutely. Happy, happy to help. Happy to answer, man. I really appreciate you having me on, man. This has been great. Yeah. Appreciate it, Z. We'll talk soon, man. Yes, sir. All right, see ya. I'll let it